transplant cardiologist at the University of Alberta, um, also a medical director of advanced heart failure transplantation, as well as the adult uh, cardiac uh, assist device program. Um, we met actually, he was at Stanford doing advanced heart failure fellowship uh, and came up to me today and said that we met 17 years ago. And I was like, that's not possible because I would have been 13. But apparently it was quite a while ago. So um, he's going to uh, speak to us about management of scat patients in cardiogenic shock. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm very glad I'm not sorry right now. <laughs> So uh, I want to talk a little bit about cardiogenic shock and SCAP patients, but uh, this is where my two hats of interventional cardiology and heart failure transplant and back kind of come together. Something that uh, I justified pretty much all my career because people always wonder why you didn't know, it just didn't make any sense. So I have no disclosures. I wanted to start with the case. Uh, this is a 46-year-old uh, woman who uh, presented with chest discomfort after having an argument at work, and uh, at that time, uh, pre-hospital assessment, she was found to have an anterior wall ST elevation by cardiac infarction. She was brought to the cath lab for primary angioplasty and on arrival was hypotensive in the definition that shock when your heart is not able to produce enough blood flow to maintain perfusion to the organs, so the low blood pressure. So she was essentially cardiac shock. She was stabilized with medications, in this case norepinephrine, and then uh, an angiogram was done. Now in this particular case now, uh, this angiogram here and co register with the OCT, and we're talking about liver modalities. But as you can see here, it's very much what uh, Dr. Sal was talking about the idea that this particular case is more likely to be a uh, type 2, uh, type 2, in this particular case, type 2A. And you can see it looks pretty normal distant, but then once you get to the mid portion of it, you can start to see the uh, intermediate mechanism here. So it was very clear that this was actually a scan case. So I will keep in suspense and tell you what happened to this patient because I'm just going to just move on to the talk. So later on, if I have an opportunity, I'll talk about what happened. So cardiogenic shock in regular rather than middle myocardial infarction uh, occurs in about 5 to 10% of our patients coming into the cath lab or to the hospital. Now, in hospital mortality, it has improved over time, and this is because, of course, our therapies and things we can offer in hospital have improved significantly. However, the unfortunate part is that 6 to 12 month mortality is still about 50%, which is no better than it was 20 years ago. So this is an area where we really have not made a lot of progress. When it comes to cardiogenic shock in the scan population, this, the incidence seems to be a little bit lower, 2 to 5%, but then maybe partly related to the fact that maybe it's being undiagnosed, or underdiagnosed rather, and we know that the specific populations in the scan group have a higher incidence, such as patients with pregnant, uh, pregnancy associated uh, scan as well. So when we talk about cardiogenic shock, the goal is very simple. You want to make sure the patient survives and the patient survives well. So at the end of the day, what I'm trying to do today is to give you a sense as to what we try to do in terms of the plan. So I'll provide you in a simplistic kind of way five uh, points to kind of tell how we approach a patient coming in with cardiogenic shock in this kind of population. So, Point number one is, who is the patient? So how do we identify a patient that has cardiogenic shock? How do you know when this patient is in trouble? So looking at the guidelines and all the papers out there, at the end of the day, we ask for about three things. One, you give them enough fluid, and they're still hypotensive. They're not providing enough blood flow to the rest of the body, in this case, by blood pressure being low, or the actual flow from the heart being low as well, okay? And that could be either on the left side of the heart with many measures like cardiac index or cardiac power output, or on the right side with something like uh, pulmonary arterial pulse to the index. But it also means they're not perfusing. So what we'll see in cases like this is they get an increase in lactate, the, the extremities will be very, very cold, and the systemic vascular resistance will be very high. So once these things start to come together, you have to start stepping back and saying, okay, maybe this patient is not doing well. If I don't intervene soon enough, maybe something, something bad is going to happen. As I mentioned before, in pregnancy-associated scan, the patients are at a much higher risk of cardiac shock, albeit a select population in this particular study. 24% of this population uh, was in cardiac shock, which is quite significant compared to the you know, 2 to 5 percent we had in the general population. So when it comes to scan, you want to make sure that if you see a patient coming in post-pregnancy or during the period, period, you would be much more vigilant, perhaps a little bit more aggressive in terms of uh, interventions early on. The second point is timing. So in this particular case, we know that 
in cardiology, we talk about times muscle, we talk about the kind of, kinds of things that we do that allow us to salvage muscle before it gets too late. When it comes to cardiogenic shock, we know that once you start to get onto one anaerobic agent, so one intravenous medication, you're starting to get in trouble. Once you get to two, you're pretty much in big trouble. And then if you continue to go from there, you're going to get to the point where there'll be no reversibility. And that, that one, of course, is not much we can do. So therefore, there's a sweet spot as to where we can actually go and intervene. Uh, Sean Van Diepen um, and the uh, group from Sky actually put together a new stage for uh, cardiogenic shock. And really, we're talking about the classic one here, provides a patient that despite being given fluids, still requires them to support others and other things. And then they will want to deeper by the spike and the support, maybe even some uh, other hemodynamic support to continue to deteriorate. Our plan, of course, is to make sure we can intervene and identify the species early on and also the building at this point. Put more simply, I would say that if you meet the criteria <coughs> for the you know, lack of response to fluid, the lack of blood flow to the heart, the co extremities, as well as the lack of uh, perfusion then you know you need to start thinking about what to do. At the end of the day, time matters because if you miss that opportunity, to get to the point where things don't improve. Now, for example, if somebody's deteriorated very quickly in front of you, you want to intervene, <coughs> you don't have that much time because they probably will not come back. As opposed to somebody who's kind of reasonably stable and slowly, gradually deteriorating, you may have a little bit more time. The concept would be simple. Where initially you have a hemodynamic problem, the blood flow is not going where it needs to go. But the rest of the body is okay. This is a perfect time to intervene. Because the moment you start to get to the point where your body is not functioning, the liver, the kidneys, your muscles, and you get to what we call a hemometabolic problem, the ability to reverse that becomes quite significantly impaired. So it's very, very important that we not only identify patients early on, but we try to intervene before we get to the point where organs start becoming compromised. Now, with that said, once you've identified the patient population, once you know the timing of it, you made a decision that you need to intervene, then you have to ask yourself, what can we do? The first thing we do is, of course, give medications. Medications are simple, intravenous medications are available very quickly, and you can start with minutes, right? But like I said before, fluids are most important. So I've gotten to the point where we no longer talk about shock if somebody is dry. There used to be a concept of kind of bleeding shock, which you don't use anymore, because unless you're full, you're not in shock. So fluids given first, they don't respond, the intravenous medications are given. There are many different types that we use. It's a table I made up, um, some years ago for uh, our fellows, but it does give us an idea as to what all these medications do, and none of them are perfect. But you try to think that the problem with cardiogenic shock is the heart's not pumping very well, and you're shut down, okay, and your fluid levels are increased, you may want a medication that allow you to deal with these problems. So generally speaking, norepinephrine and vitamin are the commonest used, and they're of course most stabilized on that group called neuronal. We're always realizing, of course, is that the heart is made up of four chambers, and two chambers we're talking about here is left and right, that are most important on the bottom side of the ventricle. Right ventricular failure related to cardiac shock is also very important to remember. So despite the fact that we're always talking about some of the things that go on the left side, never forget the idea that right ventricular failure is also very important, in which case nitric oxide and PLP may be a significant, helpful uh, uh, therapy to be used in this population. Now, if that doesn't work, which is often the case in the patients who come in with not only scattered cardiac shock, then you need to move on to something more. That would be what we can get through support. Now, Dr. Price mentioned a little bit about that before. We talked about the strategies as to what we're trying to do. But the bottom line is when somebody is acutely sick, there's the idea that one, they could maybe recover if we just get them through that, or they may require something more definitive than at a later, uh, later time. So what we tend to think about is three bridging strategies. You have to bridge the patient to recovery from the cardiogenic shock. We have to bridge into a decision because at that point in time, you don't know what's happening. You don't know anything about the patient. So you need to make sure the patient is well enough so that at some point you can make a decision what are the patient's wishes. Would the patient want us to do more for what's going on? And then of course, sometimes a bridge to a more durable mechanical support device. And this of course in the acute setting. In the chronic setting, there are other things we can do, but in the acute setting, when it comes to scab or any other cardiac shock, these are three strategies we talk about. If that's the case, then we use a temporary device option. So there are a lot of them that we can use, many of them are available in different places. Some are available in Europe and not in Canada and so on. But out of those, there's a few that we are most commonly 
be able to access and can they probably in the United States. So I'm going to just deal with maybe four or five of them. And at the same time, try to talk about the evidence specifically with regards to scatter. Now, the simplest and the easiest one, of course, is the balloon pump. And this is something that is used even in the uh, uh, literature that we talked about before. When 28%, one of the papers talk about 28% of patients getting mechanical support. Actually, the vast majority of them get a, got a balloon pump. There's nothing more than that. There's one patient with ECMO, one patient with something a little bit more than that. The vast majority got a balloon pump. Now, with that said, there's absolutely no data that improves outcome in either scan or in uh, cardiac shock. And part of the problem is even though it's a very easy device to put in, it only provides 0.5 liters per minute of support. What that means then is a normal heart should be pumping at about 5 liters per minute. So if you're in cardiogenic shock and you're pumping less than 3 or maybe even 2, adding that 0.5 liters per minute extra really doesn't do very much. So generally speaking, then, from a physiology point of view, but also from a data point of view, there's nothing that supports the movement of the team. The exception, perhaps, is when you have significant microrepresentation when one of the valves is leaky, then this may actually offload the heart a little bit to allow you to pump a little bit better. The other one is called the impella. It's actually a device that goes directly into the heart and actually uses an axial helix flow pump to suck blood from the ventricle and then pump it out to the aorta. It does a much better job than the moon pump does and is able to now put up even upwards of four liters per minute. So even if your heart was working very poorly, about less than one or two liters, it can actually maintain reasonably or at least close to normal flow. Now, there are very, very few reports when it comes to a scan. There's actually one report, which is mostly an abstract, and a few unpublished reports. But generally speaking, all the data suggests that it can improve the actual numbers, but there is no data suggesting that it improves overall outcome. Now, one thing I will say about this particular device is that it does improve coronary perfusion. So, if a bridge to recovery is your strategy, you want to maintain coronary perfusion as best as you can because if you have the blood vessel that's causing problems to the muscle, you don't want the muscle to be infarct. So therefore, maintaining blood flow to the blood vessel becomes important. So in this particular case, the impella device may be helpful. Now, one thing that we use perhaps a little bit more frequently in very patients that come to our center is the ECMO, or uh, extracorporeal member oxygenation. So it is a particular device that allows us to be able to provide support in full. It provides both right and left ventricular support, but also provides oxygenation support. So if somebody is actually very, very unwell with the lungs from the fluid, but it, it can't even get oxygen in there, this can actually be done. There's some case reports specific in the scan population, mostly central, but a couple of peripheral ones that suggest not only that it's beneficial in the short term, but now we have uh, data suggesting that it does help people to recover. There are at least three or four reports of patients who've been put on ECMO and they recover uh, heart function were able to actually go home from that as well. Now, as I mentioned before, it does provide bioventricular and oxygen support. The only uh, downside to that in this particular case is that it does cause hypoperfusion of the corneas because the way it actually works, it causes pressure to be increased on the outflow. So then what happens at that point in time, you may not be able to maintain good flow through the corneas in the case of scan. Now, the device that we often use as well is called CMAT, and this is actually a true assist device. It's truly an artificial heart, and actually you can use both on the right and left side, and it does provide continual flow, and actually is a full support device. And this, of course, is a surgical device, and it can be used in the cath lab, but it does allow us the opportunity, especially in a center like ours, where we can get this done within less than about 20 minutes to half an hour to the OR. It is a very, very good device that allows you to maintain the patient on it for a longer duration, upwards of, sometimes we had a patient stay on three months, even going to physiotherapy or going on a bike and recovering from that, and of course this can be used not only as a bridge to another device, but a bridge to recovery as well. Now with all that said, all the devices that I've given you, the data isn't really there to support the usage of any of this in this cat population, so what is it that we need to do? Well, it's a really nice um, saying, I actually feel like times you know who he is, Talk about start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. So this is a, uh, I know it's really complicated, don't even look at it and memorize it like that. But it does give us an idea as to what every one of this device, uh, all these devices do. The amount of support, uh, what kind of, how easy it is to put in, whether corner perfusion is a problem or not. But the reason I'm putting this up is that we need to understand our tools. Like, you know, if you go, Upon her coming in, you would expect that he or she would know what to do with the account and the tools that they have. Same thing applies to us. 
If we're going to use any of these devices, we need to know what the downsides are, what the upsides are, and of course, how we need to use them properly. To simplify that then, I'm just talking about flow and flow alone. We have the balloon pump here, the impeller system here, a tandem mark, which we don't have, but the impeller 5 and then the ECMO. And this is the amount of flow support that we can provide us. Now, if you look at it from a uh, flow perspective, balloon pump really doesn't look very much. That's in our center, we've actually pretty much given up using balloon pumps in, in most situations. The impella is probably more commonly used, but it does have a narrower window. So if you don't catch patients early enough and put the impella in, you may have to then move on to something else. So it becomes kind of a wasted resource at that point. But the most important thing is to know that these devices need to be available to you so that if it is appropriate, you can go ahead and use them. Now from a practical standpoint, and I realize most of you probably won't care, but maybe I'll address this side of it. Uh, we may be thought the price up there as well. Again, earlier started better. You know, catch it before it falls off the cliff, right? So if you're helping somebody and they're falling off, you don't want to catch it when they're already out, right? Because it's going to be too late. It's very important to consider having actual pre-made packs. So in our center, we actually have packs with clamps for ECMO. So they will now want put somebody in ECMO, so they bring it and they open up all the clamps are there. I don't have to worry about trying to pull all these little tiny Kellys and other things to kind of do the procedure. But the other thing specifically relating to scab patients, remember these are vascular fragility patients in many cases. Like in FMD, for example, you actually have not only coronaries and venos and whatnot, but carotids and external iliacs can be involved. So because the cannulation happens femorally, if you're not careful how you cannulate, you may actually cause more damage. So that you may actually cause not only ischemia, but significant vascular damage that may require repair. Moreover, when you're putting a wire up, if you're not careful under fluoroscopy, you may actually go to the carotids and cause a dissection. So it's extremely important. We always do this. We have to be careful to guard these. But in this kind of patients, it's much, much more important that we're careful in how we put these devices in when it comes to cannulation. And the other thing, of course, is anticoagulation. As Dr. Saw in many mentioned today, anticoagulation is contraindicated in the scab. Unfortunately, for ECMO patients, we have to fully, fully anticoagulate. So that's one of the downsides of that. So that's one of the reasons why, when possible, we try to use the impella, because that's a device that allows us to get the kind of support we want. Plus, in cases where you absolutely, for whatever reason, have to stop anticoagulation, as long as you keep the flow going really high, you don't need to anticoagulate them for a period of time. So I think it's very important to remember that in scan patients, even though ECMO may be a device of choice, it may not be necessarily one that we use. Now, we have a protocol, there's a shock team in our center, I think shock teams are very important because it isn't something that one person does. Everybody needs to be a part of it. So Dr. Price and Dr. Trinell will be perfect together in a team to work in looking at this patient because in terms of cardiology, surgeons, ICU, our nurses, and of course our coordinators and our counselors as well become very important not only decision making but also follow up after that. I won't go into detail to this, but suffice to say that it has to be a trigger point where somebody is called and then fanning out and then decisions can be very there are some contraindications. Not everybody should have a device. And of course, if they are, if they have something that is going to curtail their longevity in the short term, they probably should not have a device put in. If they have irreversible organ damage, malignancy, that's actually terminal. If they have technical factors, if they have prolonged CPR, they are not expected to recover. And of course, if they're not uh, candidates for any kind of progression of device if necessary, that would be something to do. Point number four, it's not a long one, but it does require some uh, mentioning. We always think about what to do at the time of. But if you don't think about what comes next, you may run into troubles because then you're stuck with a patient that may not necessarily have a place to go. There's no bailout. So it's very, very important at the point of decision making to ask yourself the question, if this doesn't work, what do I go next? Or if this does work, what do I go next? So the follow-up becomes very important. So allowing reassessments on a regular basis, having a team that can make those decisions together with you is extremely important when using any kind of hypodynamic device in patients with progenic shock, uh, whether it be scattered or otherwise. Of course, there's a weaning evaluation that we all do, but this is not that important or technical. But if we are thinking about recovery, we need to make sure that we don't take the devices out before they're ready to be taken out. Because if you take it out and they crash again, now the second time you put the device in is much more dangerous from a complication standpoint, but also outcome. So when we look at weanings and we ask them, how are they doing clinically? How is their function? the heart improving? What the structure look like? Hemodynamics. And of course, something that we don't think about is the electrical. 
If their heart is really slow, the bradycardic, for example, everything else will be perfect. But if they don't have the ability to increase the heart rate as, ne as necessary, they will fail weakness as well. So this is, of course, a general, just general concept. And then number five, of course, this is one of the probably one of the things that we sometimes don't do as well as we should, but communication with the team, and that includes not only the patient, but also family and other team members becomes important at the time of the surgery, at the time of the intervention, but also moving on when uh, the patient is either doing well or otherwise. So to summarize, I'm going to say that scan patients are a high risk for cardiac shock because, especially if the, the pregnancy is associated, there's a positive data in terms of how to be high management, and that's the reason why a team approach becomes important so that everybody can have the input and the expertise can come up with a consensus that's good for the patient and for the team as well. It's very important specifically in scan patients to avoid vascular complications and having the ability to appropriately and timely escalate becomes important. Not just a bit of that, and thank you very much. <laughs>